I'm Suresh Arani, I'm a neurologist in Oxford and I run the autoimmune neurology um, group here and we research um, with our main focus is research on encephalitis. So LGI1 antibody encephalitis is a autoimmune form of encephalitis caused when antibodies target the brain. So the antibodies in this case target the protein called LGI1 and of course antibodies are normally meant to be protective particularly against infection, but in this disease they seem to target our own brain protein erroneously and that brain protein is called LGI1. Patients typically present in their um, later years of life, usually in their 60s and 70s, and they present with a few weeks of seizures and memory loss as the two most important common features of this condition. The seizures often have very characteristic features, they're often very frequent, they're often very short, and many patients will have the characteristic fasciobrachial dystonic seizures, which are almost diagnostic of this condition. Some patients will also present with changes in their um, personality, they'll often present with confusion, and a few patients present with a sleep disturbance in addition. So nowadays the disease is diagnosed clinically predominantly because the seizures often f present with such characteristic features and the memory loss is also pretty typical. Alongside all the other features, most patients can be diagnosed purely clinically. However, it's also extremely useful to have a diagnostic test to um, help guide that diagnosis. And the diagnostic test is of course here the antibody against LGI-1, which is detected in the blood, in the serum, more, more readily than it is in the spinal fluid. A few tests which also help make the diagnosis and, and typically help when the antibody is not yet available include the MRI of the brain, which can show some swelling in the region of the brain called the hippocampus particularly. Also an electroencephalogram, so an electrical test of brain waves, typically shows a diffuse problem with the brain, which can then be part of the diagnosis of any encephalitis, but certainly contributes to this diagnosis. So the answer to this is pretty straightforward in that nobody really knows what causes this condition. It's something we're actively working on. And the first clue we have is that patients have a genetic predisposition to this condition. It's important to state that this does not mean it is an inherited condition as we've seen no patients who pass this on to their, the rest of their family. But what we find is that a molecule which is intimately involved in the way the immune system crosstalks within itself known as an HLA molecule, is abnormal in around 95% of patients with this condition. It's almost a universal finding here. We are working on this more intensively at the moment because this is a really exciting clue to try and figure out what might cause this condition. One possibility is that the cross-reactive antibody was originally intended to react with a foreign bug, which we're trying to clear. And maybe this HLA molecule will give us clues as to which bug that was and perhaps which kind of bugs might have triggered this illness in the first place. We know these conditions are caused by the autoantibodies, but what we don't know is which cells make these autoantibodies and where these cells lie. Do they lie in the spinal fluid? Do they lie in the blood and then the antibodies access the brain? This is all really quite unknown at the moment. And so we're spending a lot of time trying to work out which cells in which compartments produce the antibodies that cause the disease, and hence try and figure out which cells might be best targeted in future with treatments that might become available in the next few years. Most patients with LGI-1 antibody encephalitis are treated with a variety of immunotherapies, which essentially suppress the immune system and try to reduce the production of those antibodies. Steroids are probably the most used treatment and we find them very effective in reducing the number of seizures but also sometimes quite rapidly improving the cognitive and psychiatric deficits seen in the patients. However, of course, steroids come with a number of side effects and many patients unfortunately do experience these sorts of side effects which include weight gain and other mood disturbances which can occur secondary to the steroids themselves. In addition, patients often receive other medications such as intravenous immunoglobulins, which are a pooled blood product, but appear to help reduce both the seizures and again the cognitive deficits. 
in our experience, they're not quite as effective as the steroid medications. And then finally, the other medication or the other intervention that can help is an intervention called plasma exchange, where we will um, often put patients through a three or four hour procedure where they have their blood washed of large molecules such as the autoantibodies. And the idea is we deplete the blood of the antibodies and return the rest of the blood to that individual patient. And this often gives patients relief of a few weeks from the antibodies and gives the other medications a chance to kick in. The final thing to say is that lots of patients will um, have anti-seizure medications, traditional anti-seizure medications, and currently the jury's out as to whether they are required or whether they are surplus to requirements in this condition. The outcome of patients with LGO one antibody encephalitis is still a matter of future research. From what we see in clinic, we know that many patients are left with residual cognitive, psychiatric, and some social issues. Firstly, we know that memory is an ongoing problem. Sometimes personality change is a problem, and emotionality seems to be a problem, where patients often cry at otherwise relatively minor stimuli, for example, watching a film. We also know that patients have a number of problems with mood and anxiety in the long term, and these are very difficult to treat sometimes, but require special attention because there are medications which can help. In addition, we know now that fatigue is a problem with these patients in the long term. And of course, in terms of social difficulties, many patients never quite get back to working, never quite get back to their baseline function, often rely on other members of their family in particular to help look after aspects of their daily care. So this condition can have a real, really large impact on patients from many different domains. In addition, it's clear that relapses occur in a small proportion of patients. It appears this proportion goes down as patients are given longer and more intensive immune therapies. However, of course, these come with side effects, and so there's clearly a risk balance to be um, played out here in terms of trying to avoid side effects, but at the same time prevent potentially really quite devastating relapses in some patients. Some of our current work in the Oxford Autoimmune Neurology Group is aimed at trying to improve these outcomes both by understanding them in the first place, and we're surveying many of the patients that come to our clinic to understand more about them, but also then to look at whether the interventions that patients have received and the types of therapies and their duration and the nature of the dosing affects their outcomes in the long term. And hopefully the, these sorts of data will feed into our future understanding of how best to treat patients.